For centuries, the rivers of New Zealand have carved their mark on the landscape. As early as 850 AD, the Waitaha tribe were drawn to this valley to live by the river and give it its name. Evidence of this still remains in the limestone near Duntroon. That was centuries ago, but the great resource in the valley remains and flows to the sea, a resource that still draws people to the valley and supplies one of our most important sources of energy. Electricity. Electrical production now produces 96% of all New Zealand's electricity. And behind the humble light switch is the dedication of hundreds of skilled workers in a multi-billion dollar operation. An operation on demand 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and so integrated with our environment, it has become part of it. Bountiful rainfall, beautiful lakes and fast-flowing rivers enable Electricorp to produce over 75% of the country's electricity from this safe, clean, renewable resource. And nearly one-third of this production is produced here on the Waitaki River. The strength of the Waitaki is drawn from deep in the heart of Mackenzie country. Lakes Tekapo, Pukaki and Ohau lie at the base of the Southern Alps, fed by snow and rain that falls in this vast catchment area. These three lakes are linked by 58 kilometers of canal, involving the excavation of 45 million cubic meters of spoil. Taking advantage of this newly created resource, Electricorp constructed three small generating plants on the main Ohau Canal, operated by radio control from Twizel. In the early 1920s, it became obvious that the first state-constructed power station at Coleridge would not be able to supply the growing demand for electricity. Coleridge had been constructed to supply Christchurch, but the demand for electricity grew by 15% a year, and it was obvious that a new power source was needed. On appraisal, the Waitaki River met all the requirements for both short- and long-term development, and in 1925, preliminary field surveying commenced downstream from Tekapo. Mapping and drilling commenced at Rosney, now the site of Aviemore, but coal deposits deterred the engineers. Worried that leakage under the dam would be a problem, a site at Awakina was finally approved for the first dam. By then it was 1928, and the need for a new power source was urgent. Completion of the dam by 1931 was necessary. A set of drawings were supplied outlining what was required, and the rest was left to local ingenuity. The conditions were harsh. Pick, shovel and horses were used for all the excavation. The pay was 17 cents an hour, and not all went according to plan. The first of three floods was to hit the Waitaki construction in 1929, taking out the middle of the newly constructed trestle bridge that spanned the river. In January 1931, the second flood hit. Sandbagging prevented any real damage, but in February of the same year, the worst flood in 52 years covered the working areas near the river and carried away both bridges. More floods, heavy snow and two earthquakes continued to make already trying conditions even worse. But in October 1934, the Governor-General Lord Bledisloe opened the Waitaki Dam. With the turn of a switch, the lights came on in the great powerhouse. The irony of this was that nothing had been tested, and the power that fed the lights came not from the new Waitaki, but from Coleridge, turned on out of sight of the crowd. Nine men died in the harsh conditions building this dam, hundreds were injured. The plight of the workforce and the despair of the depression was seen by the Kurau minister, the Reverend Arnold Nordmeyer, and the local doctor, D.G. McMillan. And when they both entered Parliament in 1935, it was their experiences on the Waitaki that gave birth to the Social Security Bill introduced by the Savage government in 1939. The Waitaki Dam now stands as a tribute to real Kiwi ingenuity and determination, feeding up to 500 gigawatts of electricity into the national grid through Glenavy and Ben Moore generated by seven turbines housed in a powerhouse that was excavated from solid rock by hand. The lake formed by the dam now has become an established habitat for fish and birds, and its pleasant shores attract many people in the summer months. Below the dam, salmon fishing is popular, and trout abound in the main river and many tributaries. It was to be almost a quarter of a century until a new power source was to be developed on the Waitaki. <laughs> The new dam proposed was to be built at Benmore, 
and would be the largest undertaking of its kind in New Zealand. But the dam almost took second place to what was to be known as the Otamatata village. This was to be built some five kilometres from the dam site and housed the workforce and their families for the ten years of construction. Omaru was the nearest town of any size and it was from here that construction workers, carpenters and assorted tradespeople came from to build the Otamatata village. Being only 70 miles away, the trip should have taken just over an hour. But Omaru was in the grip of prohibition, and between Otamatata and three miles from Omaru, there were four fine hotels. Competition for work at Otamatata was fierce. How do prices compare in Otamatata with uh, the prices in the larger towns outside here? Well, I believe we do pay a little more, but I wouldn't like to comment on it, really. My husband's very happy on these jobs and likes it very much. And the money is good? Oh, yes, definitely. It was uh, not uncommon for £50 to be deposited by a single person or by one person per fortnight. That's per um, uh, payday. Yes, payday. This new social environment worked. With modern shops, a magnificent picture theatre, playgrounds, schools, library, the dam went ahead smoothly, ahead of schedule and under budget. Its height will be 360 feet right across the valley. As the newsreel of the day shows, the dam would stretch across the valley and eventually form a lake 79 square kilometres in area. The huge earth dam grew at a rate of 18 inches a day. Twenty-eight million tonnes were carted and compacted by the workforce at Ben Moor. The leaders of the team became household names, even catching the eye of ODT cartoonist Sid Scales. Under budget and ahead of schedule, the lake started to fill in December 1964. It filled at a rate of two feet per hour, and men worked night and day downstream to reform the river and finish the coffer dam. A massive fish salvage operation was mounted to protect and save the trout as the river level dropped. 25,350 fish were moved to deeper water. 6,580 in one day alone. Days later, the first water tumbled down the spillway. And in January 1965, the first power was generated at Ben Moore. Officially commence the inter-island power transmission from this great and unique Ben Moore power station. Today, the 693,000 kilowatt turbines supply 2,200 gigawatt hours of electricity to both the South and North Islands. Benmore is unique among New Zealand power stations in that power being transmitted to the North Island is converted in these mercury valves from alternating current to direct current. This is transmitted through the inter-island line to Haywards near Wellington, where it is converted back to alternating current and fed into the North Island transmission system. The lake has become popular with holiday makers and tourists, and an extensive tree planting program has been successful, enhancing what was once a very barren landscape. 19 kilometres downstream in the same year that Ben Moore produced its first power, the river had just been diverted at Aviemore, and construction of the youngest dam on the Waitaki had begun. This dam was to be built by the largest piece of war surplus equipment ever sold, a Johnson concrete badger, capable of pouring 140 cubic yards of concrete an hour, and straight from a successful season rebuilding Pearl Harbour, it was needed. Aviemore is one of New Zealand's biggest concrete constructions, and like Ben Moore, it was always ahead of schedule and under budget. It now has an output of 220,000 kilowatts, and for those of us who don't have any idea how much that is, it's enough to run 3,666,660 watt light bulbs. 29 square kilometres of lake form behind the dam, stretching back to Ben Moore. It's now dotted with boat harbours, picnic spots, and some 20,000 trees and shrubs. Below the dam, an artificial spawning race provides for the trout, which formerly migrated upstream from Lake Waitaki to spawning grounds just above the Aviemore site. One kilometre long, the race can hold 3,000 adult fish. To utilise the potential of the Waitaki River and help meet the needs of a growing New Zealand, the shape of this valley has been changed forever. Certainly, tapping the river's flow has meant the creation of new resources. But the fact still remains. Unlike coal or gas, electricity cannot be stored. But the water that constantly flows into these great new lakes is the guarantee of a continued supply of electricity.